Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In these videos, we're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were discussing the profound truths presented us in chapter 7, how that the law is holy, just, and good, but the purpose of the law is to cause us to face up to the fact of our sinfulness and our weakness to accomplish its righteous standard through our own strength through our own efforts. This conflict actually serves a purpose in our lives. The Holy Spirit is showing us that anything that we seek to do or keep from doing in our own strength brings us under legal bondage because the principle of law applies to the self-life and can produce nothing but self-righteousness. Simply put, the law shows us our need for Christ. The new man serves the law of God, the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now, at the present time, within this conflict between the old man and the new man, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No condemnation now. The text says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, and the evidence of manuscripts seems to show that this clause formed no part of the original text of this verse. Take note of the fact that many of the other translations don't include this phrase, but that it was added by the translators. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, that is Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5:18 and 19. Condemnation has no relationship to who we are in Christ, to who to who have been made righteous, those of us who have been made righteous, no, no one who is righteous, and that is what God says we are, can face condemnation. It also must be said that the statement of there being now no condemnation is, is no more, uh, just, it's not, well, it's not just mere, a mere legal arrangement. It, it, is a, it has to do with a union in life, believers through the indwelling of Christ's Spirit in us. Our having one life with Him, the head and the members of the same body having one life. Condemnation finds no place in our being one with Christ. Our, our union with Christ itself eliminates any possibility of condemnation. God cannot, will not condemn any child of God who has been made one with Christ because of that unity. Since there is no condemnation as it regards the corporate body of Christ, the body of Christ as a whole, no individual believer can face condemnation. Our belief in Christ assures us of no condemnation. It is not dependent upon how we walk as Christians. John 3.18 states, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The no condemnation is conditioned upon belief, not our walk. And Scripture never presents contradiction. King James Version only believers will tell you that the, the KJV is the only translation that's inspired by God. That isn't true. The King James Version is a translation just like any other. And many examples of textual criticism can be shown to be really added by the translators in, even in the King James Version. There, there's over 500 English translations alone. The original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts are what God inspired and they are without error. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The no condemnation is conditioned upon belief, not our walk.
So in the midst of this conflict between the old man and the new man, there is therefore now, at the present time, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Most of modern Christianity says we're working toward an end to become righteous. That's the predominant Protestant model. God declared he made us righteous right from the very beginning. We start off that way. We begin on that basis. That's, we begin on that ground. When God declared he made you righteous, what kind of job do you suppose he did? God declared to the Israelites one time that they had made God altogether too much like themselves, Psalms 50, 21. And every time I read that text, I think we've made God too much like us. Oh, God tries hard, and sometimes he does a decent job. And some people, he did a pretty good job with them, but boy, you look at some of the others, and I don't know, you know, he made a mess of them. I mean, that's not the God that I know. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kill us the prophets and stone us them that are sent unto thee. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Luke 13, 34. See, Steve, God wanted to do something, but he couldn't. No, no. The lesson he was teaching was that there is nothing good in man's will, the fallen will, nothing good in the flesh. They wouldn't, so he did. In fact, chapter 8 is going to close with whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. There is now in the midst of this conflict that we saw in chapter 7, no condemnation. How can there be condemnation if you're absolutely righteous? It's because people look so much at the flesh. Apparently, Christians love to stomp around in that garbage. You will stand and give an accounting for how you built on Christ, but there is no condemnation. You are as righteous as Christ. You're not growing in righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For those of you who are new creations in Christ Jesus, you are absolutely perfect. You stand before God without fault and without blemish. For those of you who are new creations in Christ Jesus, you are absolutely perfect. You stand before God without fault and without blemish, even in the midst of this conflict between the old man and the new man. Why? Because it's the new man that stands before God without fault and without blemish, without spot. There is now no judgment. The no there in the Greek is the intensified negative. It's a, a literal translation would be, Dearly beloved, there is really now no judgment, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Christ Jesus is a dative in the sphere of Christ, in the control of Christ. That's who we are. And now we are entering into the area of sanctification, walk, life, growth, growth, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification is thought to have to do with sin. It does not. Sanctification is being set apart for something. Now, some may argue that God set us apart from sin, but God didn't set you apart from sin. We were crucified with Christ. We died to sin. He set you apart, the new man, to himself. Did he do a fair job of that? Did he set some of you apart more than he did others? The problem is we don't see the design of God. God had some design in an early death for Stephen and in a late death for Peter. God had design in the fact that Moses didn't believe him. Because you did not believe me, you will not enter rest, the promised land. Yet Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration. God says he works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I don't know what his purpose in your life is, but I know a God who knows. I know a God who has set you apart for himself. Now, I do believe there is a growing awareness of that, but there's a fantastic difference between a growing awareness of sanctification and an increasing sanctification. Many good old theologians tell you, you know, you're sanctified, you are being sanctified, and you will be sanctified, past, present, and future. 
and I don't see how much they've thought that through. I believe you are slowly becoming aware of the fact that God has set you apart for himself. If you want to look at that as progressive, well, go right ahead. Think of this. The Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, set you apart for himself, and he's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And what most of us want that to be is the strength of the, of the flesh rather than a yielding to the Spirit. You don't face condemnation because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and you're set apart to the God of all glory, the sovereign, almighty God who makes no mistakes. He didn't set you apart partially. He set Paul apart from his mother's womb, and Paul didn't have much of a, a spiritual glimpse of that until he was an old man. I'm not going to question God and His purposes. Why is a man born blind? Why a lame man in Acts? Forty years he begged. The redeemed Son of the Almighty Eternal God, Creator of heaven and earth, the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, and his child laid and begged for alms for forty years. And people say, what kind of God is that? Well, He's a God of grace, of purpose, of design. Think of the reward of that beggar, because he hadn't if he hadn't been there, Peter never could have preached his sermon. Is it worth 40 years of begging to have 3,000 people come to the knowledge of God's glory? Does God have a purpose? Believe me, dearly beloved, he does. He holds you in the palm of his hands. He bottles your tears. He, he knows the paths that you take. He said that after he's tested you, you shall come forth as gold. He directs you. He sustains you. But more than that, he loves you. Now, if you read through these verses where the word flesh appears in the text from, from the position that we're under law, law keeping is a rule of life, then you're going to view the word flesh as everything out there in the world that you were before you came to know Christ outside the realm of Christian life and service. You know, that's just all that garbage that you know we used to be involved in or we see the world wallowing in. But when you come to understand that the Bible speaks of flesh as that which can and does operate inside the sphere of Christian life and service as well, that flesh is most often spoken of in the context of law, legalism, that God sees the flesh as a branch which operates in, in Christian service independently of the vine, that flesh is often referred to as a Christian's confidence in oneself, self-confidence, dependence upon self, then what you, what you are reading all makes perfect sense. We are now understanding the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. I ask that you keep one thought in mind as I read the first 15 verses of chapter 8. That what the text is teaching us, what it is in fact teaching us, is that we do not live the Christian life in our own strength, which amounts to walking in the flesh according to law. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. If you notice, I've color-coded this, all of this in black and orange. Both, both of these colors, black and orange, is related to living the Christian life in our own strength, self-dependence, law, the old man, the flesh. Verses 1 through 15 are beautiful in their construction. To me, they read like poetry. I believe, and this is just my belief, you're welcome not to agree with me, I believe that the reason why we are seeing such abounding grace in this epistle is because our Lord Jesus Christ wanted us to experience as much of heaven and eternity as we could in this temporal life before he brought us home. It seems to me that there's nothing he didn't give us as far as spiritual blessings go. It's like he couldn't give us enough. Our lives are so abundant, rich and full of grace. It's just like him to do that. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all, I truly do. Thanks for watching.